We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Two years after the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia perished in the Texas sky, seven astronauts are preparing for the Space Shuttle's return to flight mission. For the shuttle to fly again, NASA engineers must develop technologies to correct the fatal flaws that brought Columbia down and make space flight safer than ever before. Failure could mean the end of the Space Shuttle program and threaten the future of human space exploration. If we can't fly the shuttle safely, then there's no point in continuing. Getting back into space will not be easy. And the stakes couldn't be higher. From its maiden voyage in 1981 to 2005, the Space Shuttle has made the slow crawl to the launch pad 113 times. Soon, it will embark on the most critical mission in its history. For the first time in nearly two and a half years, the Shuttle will carry seven of the world's best and brightest into space. It will also carry the hopes of a nation and the legacy of a fallen crew. I think this flight is going to prove to the people of this country that NASA is back in the business of human spaceflight, that NASA can recover from a tragedy and can learn from its mistakes and can press ahead in a constructive and forward-looking way. Air Force Colonel Eileen Collins is NASA's first female shuttle commander. She will be leading STS-114, the official name of the first shuttle mission since the Columbia disaster. I have learned that there are risks with the shuttle that I didn't know about a year ago, but I don't think I've basically changed my attitude. Um, people often ask me, are you afraid to fly in space? And, you know, my answer is no. If I was, I wouldn't be here. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Jim Kelly will serve as pilot for the mission. Veteran astronauts Andy Thomas, Steve Robinson, and Navy Captain Wendy Lawrence will also be making the historic flight. For research scientist Charlie Kamada and for Soichi Noguchi of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, STS-114 will mark their first journey into space. This mission is going to be very unique. We're going to be attempting to do things that were never even thought of before. Human spaceflight is an inherently dangerous business. The crew of STS-114, like others before them, know there are risks and they accept them. But sometimes there is the ultimate price to pay. February the 1st, 2003. Seven astronauts aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia prepared to come home. Their 16-day scientific research mission had been a success. Commander Rick Husband and the crew of STS-107 began the hour-long journey to a small landing strip at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The morning of February 1st, I think, was, was just like the anticipation of, of every shuttle landing. Once the go is given for the deorbit burn, uh, the atmosphere really starts to build and get more and more festive. Racing through the atmosphere at eight kilometers per second, Columbia was enveloped by superheated gas. 
Uh, and it's really neat. It's a bright orange yellow out over the nose, all around the, uh, the nose. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. Uh, done so far, fly. We have good trims. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. Okay. The flight team in mission control closely monitored the re-entry. Suddenly, sensors near Columbia's landing gear showed a spike in temperature. Left outboard and left inboard both tires. Is it instrumentation max? Flight max tires are also off. Tire pressure was lost completely. And Columbia Houston, we see your tire pressure messages and we did not copy your last. Roger. Contact was lost. Columbia Houston, UHF comm check. Columbia had disintegrated in the skies over Texas. It was one of the darkest moments in NASA history. Commander Rick Husband, pilot Willie McCool, mission specialists Laurel Clark, Kalp Nachaula, Dave Brown, Mike Anderson, and Ilan Ramon of the Israel Space Agency all perished. These were our friends that we were responsible for protecting, getting there and bringing back. All of the focus was, was on, oh my God, how did this happen? What just happened? Until those questions could be answered, NASA's three remaining shuttles, Atlantis, Discovery, and Endeavour, would be grounded. The future of the American space program was suddenly very uncertain. How much work needed to be done before NASA would dare to launch another space shuttle? And how long would it take? In February 2003, the space shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it attempted to return to Earth. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board, or CABE, was formed within hours of the disaster. I immediately thought about what a tragedy this was in both personal terms, because I knew the shuttle had a very large crew these days. Uh, and I also uh, uh, thought that, uh, that it might have serious program implications, because many people had speculated if we have another major shuttle disaster, we'd probably have to shut the program down. Admiral Gaiman and his team of independent experts had one job, to find out what had gone wrong. Their investigation quickly revealed that 82 seconds after Columbia had blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center, a piece of insulating foam had torn away from the external fuel tank. Digitally enhanced video shows that the debris had struck one of the brittle panels that lined the wing's leading edge. The U-shaped panels, made of a carbon composite material, had protected the shuttle's aluminum skin from the heat of re-entry. Many NASA engineers refused to believe that the lightweight foam could have damaged the panels. But the Accident Investigation Board was not so sure. To find out, they fired foam through a massive air cannon at the wing panels. The foam struck with so much force, it created a gaping hole. Sixteen days after launch, Columbia returned home with a similar hole in the left wing. The heat ate its way through the shuttle, tearing it apart from the inside out.
generally speaking, in any enterprise like this, there are many, many safety checks and, and opportunities to stop a process which is not going well. And the fact that these processes failed is the fault of the organization, not the foam. Foam ripping away from the external tank was nothing new. It had occurred on nearly every shuttle launch to date. But until Columbia, it had never caused serious problems. Some NASA managers had simply come to view the potential hazard as acceptable. A cultural mindset that NASA could no longer ignore. The normal bureaucratic response is to find the widget that broke, fix it. Find the person who is closest to the widget, fire him or, or retrain him or replace him, and consider that, that the problem is solved. Whereas the uh, conditions which allowed that accident to happen have not been fixed. In August 2003, the accident board released its final report on the loss of Columbia and her crew. In the end, the nation has to decide whether or not the gain that we benefit from this exploration is offset by the loss of seven lives. It drove us to write a report which was of such depth and significance that we felt that we had done honor to the loss of the seven lives. The report outlined numerous engineering and organizational fixes that needed to be made in order to prevent another tragedy. The seven astronauts of STS-114 will be the first to test those changes. But our primary goal is to test out anything we need to test out that comes out of the CABE report or anything else we've come up with uh, that will help us in making the vehicle better testing it to make sure that the changes we made are good, and then seeing if there's anything we can do better in the future. It hits the floor and then it goes Leaving a positive legacy for Columbia and the crew of STS-107 is an equally important objective. We don't talk a lot during the training about specifics of 107, but we all know it's there. It's in the back of our minds. Uh, for many of us, we were closely related to a number of the people on the crew. It was not just a professional loss for us, it was a personal loss. And so we all feel it very deeply to this day. It's very difficult, obviously, to lose seven friends and to do so at once. And we all understand how important the space program was to the crew of SCS-107. And to be able to basically be on the flight that helps get the space program back into space and going again, like I said, is a, is a huge privilege. The return to flight launch date was set for the autumn of 2004. For the engineers committed to getting the shuttle and its crew safely back into space, the challenges were daunting. I would say that there may be a sense that there's a little more at stake um, doing the, during this project uh, that's underlying, but... Uh, that is only because we're trying to get the vehicle back off the ground. And we want so desperately to do that. We want to get there. And we will. Getting there will require a team effort. Preventing the foam from coming off the external tank is the first step. The accident board also require that astronauts have something that the crew of Columbia did not. The means to inspect and, if necessary, repair a damaged heat shield. Those technologies do not exist. At least, not yet. Morning. Morning. How are you? Rookie astronaut Soichi Noguchi is one of seven selected for STS-114 which is destined for the International Space Station. Steve's going into combat. My D-ring has waist tether and uh, D-ring. Okay. Extender. Yeah. 
Though all future shuttle flights will go to the station, this mission will be anything but routine. Our flight uh, now is more of a test flight to show that we are capable of uh, uh, repairing or the, I mean, the inspecting and repairing any type of damage that may occur. Noguchi, along with veteran astronaut Steve Robinson, will venture outside the station for three separate spacewalks once they are finally in orbit. Working in the unforgiving environment of space, there is little room for error. Every move must be meticulously choreographed months in advance. Astronauts train for the spacewalks, called EVA, or extravehicular activity, in the largest swimming pool on the planet. Holding more than six million gallons of water, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, or NBL, contains life-size mock-ups of both space shuttle and International Space Station components. From on board the shuttle, Andy Thomas will walk Noguchi and Robinson through procedures for inspecting and repairing damage. Procedures that are still a long way from being fully developed. The amount of work we've got to do is a bit intimidating. There's a great deal that needs to be done. On our flight, there's a lot of new elements, and so we have an awful lot of work to do to get to the point where we can be confident that those systems will work in orbit for us. When I was nine, I had this great lunchbox that showed these space guys building a space station. And I used to dream about both building a space station and working in a space station as a scientist. So for me, this is fulfillment of a long, long goal. I've never seen a space station, at least not up close. And uh, I am more than ready to go see it myself. I can't wait. Before sending astronauts into deep space, Questions about surviving in the hostile environment for long periods of time need to be answered. The International Space Station exists to provide that research. You can't build space station unless the shuttle gets back into space, because it's the only vehicle on this planet Earth that is capable of delivering the large elements to space that we need to get to the space station to complete construction. The building of the International Space Station is one of the largest and most complex engineering feats ever undertaken. Orbiting 400 kilometers above the Earth, it will weigh almost half a million kilos and house six state-of-the-art scientific laboratories. Houston Endeavour, air to ground one. We have physical separation marks executing the Houston Endeavour, are you getting down length? Well, field of view camera, you should see what else we see. There has been a permanent presence on board the space station since 2000. For the past two years, it has fallen to the Russians and the station's 16 other international partners to periodically replace the crews and provide essential supplies. Assembly is expected to finish by the year 2010, if the shuttle is able to resume flying. Until that time, everything remains on hold. When we're fit to fly, when we're safe, that's when we'll return to flying the shuttle again. First things first, fix the tank. Make sure nothing ever comes off the tank again. T minus two minutes and counting. Called ET for short, the massive external tank is comprised of three separate sections. The liquid oxygen tank on the top the liquid hydrogen tank on the bottom, 
and a middle section called the intertank flange that joins the two together. It stands 50 meters tall. Fully loaded, the tank holds almost three quarters of a million kilos of super chilled fuel. Orange insulating foam helps to maintain the fuel's cool temperatures. The foam also keeps ice from forming on the surface. Ice that could shake loose during launch and smash into the shuttle. Ironically, it was the protective foam itself that tore away and fatally gouged Columbia's heat shield. Once the tank is empty, it is released, left to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. At the time of the accident, there were eight tanks ready to fly. They all needed to be redesigned. 15 out, 15 out. The tanks are being returned from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to the Michoud assembly facility outside of New Orleans where they were built. Much of the hardware on the tank is installed after it leaves this facility. Putting a fully assembled tank back into the cell where it was constructed has never been done before. The added hardware can cause it to tilt. And the cell is not set up to protect against potential damage. But getting the tank back in is the only way engineers can determine the source of the problem and fix it. This is the first time that we have taken a tank like this with all this hardware on it and lifted it and put it into that cell with the support brackets. When you're dealing with structure this large and you're lifting it, you got to be very careful about how the structure swings, how it hangs when you're hanging on lift supports, and exactly how it's going to line up into the cell. After the first tank is successfully lifted, the real work begins. The engineers brief to find out why the foam has popped off in the past and prevent it from happening again. Redesigning the external tank is no guarantee that foam debris can be completely eliminated. If there is damage to the shuttle's heat shield, astronauts must be able to repair it before returning home through the Earth's atmosphere. So far, no one has figured out how to solve this problem. The dangers posed by falling debris are clear. Columbia's scorched remains are housed here at the Kennedy Space Center. Engineer Scott Thurston presides over the debris. At the time of the accident, he was the vehicle manager of Columbia. It was, in effect, his ship. Now Columbia has a new mission. Her mission as a spacecraft has ended in flying in space, but now she's got a mission to help us develop new and safer spacecraft. The debris makes painfully clear the need to develop a method for fixing a damaged heat shield whilst in orbit. But whether NASA engineers can accomplish this goal in time for the target launch date remains to be seen. But it won't happen unless NASA engineers figure out how to prevent foam debris from tearing away from the external tank and damaging the shuttle in the process. The Columbia accident in 2003 resulted from just such damage incurred during liftoff. Its fatal effect was not felt until the shuttle attempted to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. The conditions of re-entry are brutal. When we 
we deorbit, in about 20 minutes, we slow down to about 9,000 miles per hour from 17,000 plus. And we do that with this fireball that's flying around the outside of the space shuttle. This is dangerous, dangerous business. The shuttle returns to Earth without power. It glides home belly first, relying on Earth's atmosphere to slow it down. Friction creates a fireball that engulfs the shuttle. Temperatures along the bottom reach 1,260 degrees centigrade. More than 20,000 lightweight heat-resistant ceramic tiles are needed to protect the bottom of the shuttle from those temperatures. Each one is individually machined for a precise spot. A black coating keeps the heat from penetrating the tile's fragile surface. The leading edges of the wings and nose cap get even hotter than the underbelly. Temperatures in these areas can reach 1,650 degrees centigrade. The ceramic tiles on the bottom of the shuttle would simply melt if exposed to that heat. Distinguishable by its light gray color, a stronger, more heat-resistant material called reinforced carbon-carbon, or RCC, protects the nose and wings. Until Columbia, falling foam debris from the external tank had never struck a wing's leading edge. But the lightweight tiles that cover the bottom of the shuttle had been damaged with alarming regularity. We examined the records of every single orbiter which has returned from flight and the damage of every orbiter. And some of the orbiters came back with significant damage. In one or two cases, the orbiter has come back with complete tiles missing. As seen in these impact tests, even small pieces of foam debris from the external tank can seriously damage the tiles. If damage to critical areas is severe, the brittle styrofoam-like tiles are useless against searing heat. It can be a rudimentary kind of repair, and you can, and you can make it back. Uh, we looked at changing orbits, changing speed. You know, we looked at all the other things you can do, and we eliminated them all. You can't do anything else. But a rudimentary repair has a high probability of success in our mind. So we felt that an on-orbit repair kit was, was necessary. Tile repair is one of the most challenging of the return to flight requirements. The necessary tools for repair have never been successfully developed. NASA engineer Laura Bailey and her team have been entrusted to build them in time for launch. We need to have tile repair as a baseline for getting the vehicle off the ground. We need to provide that um, as a safety measure for our next flight. And it has to be done, and we have to have it available and ready to use. The tile repair material Bailey and her team have been given to work with has existed for more than 20 years. Its official name is STA-54. Its nickname is Goo. The cork-like substance is effective in filling in and sealing areas of damaged tile. Tests have shown it can survive the 1,260-degree heat of re-entry. But STA-54 is not without its problems. The material itself it tends to be very difficult to use. It's gooey. It's sticky. It sticks to anything that you want to try to put it on. The goo is formed when two separate components are mixed together. Three, two, one, start. To be effective for repairs, it must be mixed in an exact ratio and for an exact amount of time just before it is applied to the tile damaged site. And all of that has to happen in the handle of the gun that Bailey and her team are trying to develop. 
Whether the applicator gun is easy enough for astronauts to handle in their big pressurized spacesuits remains an open question. The gun handle is way too big. Oh, Having a nozzle that has to be placed in very close proximity potentially to a damaged tile site is actually going to be a real challenge because we don't want to be bumping into the tile and causing more damage with it. Now, well, they didn't see this rigid concept, right? Can I let no. go of this? Yeah, you can. Okay. In the neutral buoyancy lab, astronauts Soichi Noguchi and Steve Robinson work to develop the delicate tile repair procedures. Once in orbit, they will perform the new techniques on pre-damaged tiles stored in the payload bay. But if the shuttle sustains real damage, they could be called upon to actually perform the repair. Their input now in the development process is critical. This is a whole new task, and we spend a lot of time discussing with engineers, and we spend a lot of time underwater, and. Uh, try to uh, come up with a good solution. There are other weightless environments besides water where Bailey and the astronauts can practice repair techniques. This is NASA's specially modified KC-135 aircraft, a flying laboratory known as the Vomit Comet. Like a giant roller coaster, the plane flies in a series of steep arcs. During the high-speed descent, the aircraft's acceleration matches the Earth's gravity. The result is 20 to 30 seconds of weightlessness. Bailey uses the opportunity to determine how far away from a surface and at what angle the nozzle needs to be held in order for the material to be effective in a weightless environment. Many more tests will be needed. Early indications suggest that Bailey and her team are close to solving a problem that has eluded engineers for more than 20 years. For less critical damage, engineers have developed another tile repair tool called the emittance wash applicator. It contains a paint-like material that will be applied to areas of the tile where the heat-resistant coating is missing. The wash is effective at protecting damage as deep as several centimeters. Severe gouges will require something more. Here in the orbiter processing facility, the space shuttle Atlantis sits buried beneath tons of scaffolding. Atlantis was just weeks away from launch at the time of the Columbia accident. Now, it is scheduled to fly the return to flight mission. She's a little bit different color. Scott Thurston, once in charge of Columbia, is now the vehicle manager for Atlantis. As the NASA vehicle manager, we're the lead in charge of everything that happens on that orbiter from the time she lands till the time she lifts off. Today marks a milestone for Thurston's team. The last reinforced carbon-carbon panel is being installed on Atlantis's left wing. It was damage to one of these that doomed Columbia and her crew. Since the accident, every panel has undergone exhaustive examination and x-rays. The 20-year-old RCC panels for Atlantis are in good condition. They are safe to fly. The installation process will take hours. You guys are aware that we have a need. We're going to change the landing sequence. There are a total of 44 panels on the shuttle. 22 for each wing. Each one costs about $800,000. But if damaged prior to re-entry, they will be worthless. Unless they can first be repaired. Along with having a tile repair capability for the bottom of the shuttle, 
fixing damage to the wing leading edge is another return to flight requirement. But unlike the tile repair efforts, which began in the early days of the shuttle program, RCC repair is starting from scratch. There are only a few RCC repair processes even being considered, mainly because there are few materials that can withstand heat in excess of 1,650 degrees. This one, called the wrap, is for fixing large areas of damage like the hole left in Columbia's wing. It is the most comprehensive repair and the most complex. If there were a hole or a crack in a leading edge panel, then what we would do with the wrap is actually bring it out and it's actually bolted on um, to the carrier panel bolts. And you bolt it in place, tighten it up, it seals onto the leading edge so you don't have to worry about any plasma flowing underneath it during re-entry. What, kind of, what kind of carrier gas is in there? But there is a danger of applying too much force while affixing the wrap to an RCC panel. Three. The vehicle could be pushed off course. OK, here we go. Three, two, one, mark. You could actually move the shuttle out of position. But what we're doing with this test is we're actually assessing when we bring a wrap up to the leading edge and then install it, how much force that we put on the leading edge. You guys three? Okay. I want to take the rigid off. Yeah, we're going to take it off. We're going to take the rigids off. We're going all soft straps. I would do, right, I would do a couple of them. Dana Weigel is responsible for designing the step-by-step -step movements that astronauts will perform for the repair spacewalks, or EVA. These tests will help her determine how to choreograph the spacewalk without endangering the shuttle and crew. For a lot of the spacewalks that you see, we've done that seven to 10 times in the water. So part of getting the crew there and ready to do it is becoming familiar with what they're doing and understanding what to expect. So with this, it's harder to simulate doing that. In other words, when we train this in the water, we don't have an orbiter that we can push on and have it move. So for this specific case, it's harder to kind of simulate the whole end-to-end -end procedure altogether. I would say my forces were down below five to six pounds but with a few impulses to get it maybe up to 10 pounds. The tests are not going as well as some had hoped. Installing the wrap over an RCC panel requires more force than previously thought. Uh, the lows are a little higher than we had uh, originally thought they were going to be right now, but I'm sure as we refine our installation process, we'll probably get those down somewhat. Another wing leading edge repair option, called the plug, is also being tested. It is designed to repair smaller damage in the order of a 10 centimeter hole. The plug is made of a carbon composite material. It has what is similar to a toggle bolt on the back side. An astronaut would slide it through the hole and then torque it up the back side of the panel, giving it its structural attachment. Let's put a couple marks on here and try it again. OK, so let's say you were aiming, but, but go ahead and put it on here for a second. It's an ingenious idea. Or but finding a heat-resistant yeah, sealant to keep plasma gases from penetrating the edges of the plug gouges and holes are not the only threat. Small cracks in the RCC panels could also be catastrophic. What we're finding out is that the leading edge is not as robust as we thought it is to impact damage and minute amounts of coating loss from the front and back surface, maybe the size of a thumbnail, could basically bring the orbiter down. A material that can fill in the cracks and withstand 1,650 degree heat is being engineered. Six months ago, no one thought such a material could ever be developed. Today, it's a different story. This is a very creative time at NASA. The problem is difficult. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, trial and error, basically, and we're very much involved in that. 
As engineers focus on finding ways to fix damage whilst in orbit, someone has to devise a plan for the alternative scenario. If conditions in space make repair an impossibility. Developing repair capabilities in time for the return to flight mission is a difficult undertaking. And there are no guarantees that they will work. And let's see how you did. Pretty good, you're like a millimeter or two off. So that's like one of the best today. Should all else fail, there is only one other way to save the crew. A contingency plan called Safe Haven. All right. If the shuttle is unable to return home, the crew will wait on board the space station a second shuttle will have to come and rescue them. Now that is not without some risk because the space station, you know, was designed to handle three people. If you're gonna put a shuttle crew up there in addition to the two or three station crew, so that maybe you have 10 people on board, that really stresses the station systems. But we think we have a reasonable level of confidence that we can keep a shuttle crew and then the station crew safe until we can launch a rescue mission. Kennedy Space Center. With the autumn 2004 launch date just months away, vehicle manager Stephanie Stilson is struggling to have the shuttle Discovery ready for a possible rescue mission. Going all right? Discovery has not flown since oh. August 2001. Good. You been? No. Before it can fly again, there are dozens of modifications that must be made. Oh, definitely. Well, and I guess, you know, they'll, they'll take out that core, send it off to the lab and analyze and see if there's any concern with the, the panel itself. Many involve new safety technologies like cameras and sensors that have never flown before. Those are first time activities. And those are things that we have brand new hardware for, brand new engineering, brand new procedures. So anytime you bring in something that hasn't been done before, there's a chance you're gonna run into obstacles. An inspection of the orbiter Discovery proves her right. A critical piece of hardware located in the tail fin, called the rudder speed brake actuator, is removed for a routine examination. The gear is used to help slow the shuttle down and guide it during landing. X-rays of the actuators reveal something unexpected, and the consequences will be far-reaching. They took our actuators, tore those actuators apart, and sure enough, they did find some corrosion and some pitting in those gears. And because of that, they then felt that they needed to go ahead and investigate the actuators on the other vehicles. It is bad news for Atlantis vehicle manager Scott Thurston and his team. It's going to take us 14 months to get in and get those out. Because you've got to remove these four panels, the rudder and the speed brake. All that's got to come out. And then you can finally pull those actuators. We might not even have to actually fix anything, but we got to go verify they're correct. It is just one more in a growing number of setbacks. Meeting all the requirements in time for the autumn 2004 launch date will simply not be possible. The return to flight mission must be delayed. The new launch date, March 2005. The delay brings one other significant change. Atlantis will no longer be the return to flight vehicle. Being the Columbia vehicle manager, obviously I was really looking forward as being the return to flight vehicle. So it, it, it's disappointment. You know, we, we take this very serious and very personal. Say so we're going to fly second, so that, you know, we're going to fly again, and that's the important thing. Good morning. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Doing good. Stephanie Stilson's discovery will carry the crew of STS-114 into space for the historic journey. Once we got the word, um, I was elated. Uh, felt bad because Scott's a good friend of mine, and I knew he wanted to be the first to fly as well. Uh, but we had been talking about it the whole time through, and then we, we both wanted to be happy for each other. And, uh, and so we are, and I just turned out that I was the lucky one. For many crews, 
a major delay like this would be frustrating. Looks good, here we go. Go ahead. But the crew of STS-114 takes it in its stride. It's important to us that we do the right thing as an agency, um, not be driven by a schedule, but be driven by doing the right thing and making sure that the mission's successful. And we, of course, want to fly a successful mission. We want to fly a safe mission. The future of the American space program depends on the engineers who are working to overcome the myriad of obstacles before them. As the team moves closer to flight readiness, they know what is at stake. NASA will be tested, and they know failure is not an option.